Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Hey, thank God for you. Thank God for the opportunity today to share. Uh, I'm not sure who that is, but uh, it is uh, a blessing to be in the land of the living. And so we're gonna give people just a few more minutes to jump in and we're gonna get started with this evening's presentation. It's Friday evening. I'm always interested to see how people respond to the days of the week and more and more people are uh, inclined to be a part of it throughout the week. But when the weekend comes, oh man, hey pastor, we'll catch you on the flip side. But uh, I'm grateful to God again for the opportunity. And so we will give people just a few more minutes here and we're gonna get started with the lesson today. It's good to see you all as you're coming in today. Hey, Radio Raheem, how you doing? Got your mic check, that's right, get the mic check. Ms. Terry, I can see you with one of them boom box on your ear walking down the street. <laughs> straight, straight old school, Miss Terry. <laughs> All right, see Miss Coco on your way home from work. Be safe. All right, want to be you probably still at work. Miss Shantae, it's good to see your face. Yes, I know it, Miss Gwen. Miss Gwen, thank you. Bless you to you and uh, Brother Marvin. Bless you, Bishop. Yes, ma'am. Sis, how are you? Good to see you. Uh, Miss Jennifer, glad to know you're doing better today. Sister yes. Teresa, I know you had a long day today, but I'm glad to see you on. Mello, what's happening, Mello? What up, Pastor? Hey, so, Ante, Ante, how are you? I'm good. Just got finished grocery shopping, but ready for the word. <laughs> you under the altar now. You're under the altar. Bring all you to the, all you food into the storehouse. <laughs> Drop it off by the church. We'll cook it up for you. Amen. Right. <clears throat> Minister Nicole is on. Deacon Ken is on. The elder is on. We're looking good. We got one more minute here. We're going to shock and rock it. Hey, Pastor Jade. Hi, everybody. Hello, Teresa Reese. How are you? Hey, TT. Hi, Eric. Hi, hello, Hi. hello. I know it. I know it. It's been a long day. It's been a long week. Yes, sir. Start bringing a sleeping bag to the office and take a nap. Man, I'm <laughs> I don't know about nobody else. All right. How are we going to go ahead and get started? I see uh, Ms. LeVette has joined us all the way from Carolina. It's good to have you, love. Thank you for the blessing of, of your friendship and fellowship. All right. Heaven's angel is on, mom is on. Are we doing well? We're doing very well. All right. All right, it's more people than I expected on a Friday evening. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Lord, we thank you now for this time and privilege. Thank you for the blessing that you have bestowed on our lives. Thank you for bringing us to a brand new day. Oh my goodness, you've given us this day now, 12 hours in now, God, and we thank you for the manifold blessings you've bestowed on us all day long. We are here now because of your grace and your mercy that has been extended toward us. And we ask now that you meet us now, God, in this space as we begin to expostulate your word and share it now, God, so that others may be encouraged and grow, increasing our faith and our knowledge. God, we pray that you will open our understanding that we may comprehend these scriptures and apply them to our lives in a practical way that we may live a life pleasing unto you. God, we know that you are able, and so we understand now, God, better than we did on yesterday, how important it is for us to depend on you and have confidence in you. Lord, we ask now, God, that you allow us to decrease as you increase. For it's not about us, but it is all about you. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I do want to say good evening to Brother Lim as well. It's good to have you, my brother. Amen. On our uh, call tonight. And so uh, Ms. Pam has joined us. Good evening, Ms. Pam. God bless you. And uh, thank God for everybody today. We're going to be in the book of Titus tonight. Titus, 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 Titus. And so I'm not going to I'm not going to be long tonight because I know people are ready to go get pizza and sit in front of the TV, Amen, and watch your favorite show on Friday. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna oblige you today. I'm gonna oblige you today. I'm not gonna work you too hard, but I will encourage you to keep pressing on with this. Uh, we just got a few more days, if the Lord will, to. Uh, as we prepare to come to the conclusion of our uh, 21 days. Uh, and it has been fruitful. It has really been fruitful. And so I'm hoping and praying that um, you all will um, continue to study, read, follow the instructions, utilize the packet, 
as a resource, go back to it if you need to, to remind yourself of what's necessary and what's needful. Uh, I do know that uh, we didn't get uh, everybody to participate in the poll last night. And I don't know if uh, Sheree or Dr. Roz are gonna activate it tonight. Uh, I don't see either of them on tonight. So uh, there's Sheree. I'm here. I see Sheree. Ms. Sherry Bell, good evening, beloved. How are you? Uh, always glad to have my, my senior saints on, my Gloria. Uh, Jackson, missionary Reverend Dr. Gloria Jackson, Sherry Bell, my, my Johnny, and Deacon Ron. I know he's sitting somewhere close by. And so um, we just thank God for all of you. Uh, we can't have Chris on tonight, huh? Because you're rolling, um, Coco. Oh, what you say? What you say? Y'all better watch out. That's my silent friend right there, buddy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So we're in Titus tonight. And uh, Titus is a, a very uh, unique passage of scripture. The question of tonight and tonight's focus uh, that we are, are studying tonight in uh, Titus is um, uh, uh, the question is, when uh, we let go of ourselves through repentance and surrender to God, this activates the restoration process. You should have underlined the restoration process. Is there anything that you haven't let go of that may be delaying the restoration process? If so, confess those things to God so that you can have access to all he has for you. That's your, that's your responsibility. I want you to hear me now, that's your responsibility. That's why this text is so important because everybody needs to know their responsibility. Paul's letter to Titus, along with first and second Timothy, uh, serve as an active resume for anybody pursuing pastoral ministry. And so we know that, that there, are, there are a lot of people who want to be pastors, who are aspiring to be pastors, and there are guidelines to getting to that position as it is set by God through the Apostle Paul and others to really prepare that person to do the work of the Lord. And so uh, it doesn't matter uh, if it's a, a male or female, the one thing that, that any one of those individuals must understand, and that is that the priorities of the work's of, of, of being a pastor or in pastoral leadership is uh, about preaching and teaching. Pastoral ministry is about preaching and teaching. I know you see pastors that are cleaning buildings. You see pastors passing out leaflets. You, you see pastors doing everything that needs to be done in the ministry. But the reality and the priority of pastoral ministry is preaching and teaching. And it is your responsibility to make sure that the person that God has given you as a pastor teacher is able to do those things. It's critical, it's critical because it is, it, is, it is a challenge to try to keep the ministry going physically and to keep the people inspired spiritually. So Paul is writing this letter to, to Timothy and to Titus and some even conclude Philemon, but more importantly to, to uh, Timothy and Titus about the work of, 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 of being a pastor assigned or appointed to the people of God. And, and, and Paul wants to reiterate to them, and I'm reiterating it to you so you'll know that pastoring is a very serious uh, 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 responsibility and it requires three things that I've been teaching for the past five years. And I want you to always make sure that you pray for these things for whoever is your pastor and that their pastor will have faith, focus and follow through. I've been, uh, you, if you're on our prayer call every morning, you hear Kawanabe talk about and pray about faith, focus, and follow through. These are three priorities for pastoral ministry, faith, focus, and follow through. You gotta, you gotta have, you're gonna be a pastor, if you're gonna have uh, uh, the, the clergy cloth around, cloth around your neck, you gotta have faith, focus, and follow through. It's essential if you're gonna be impactful in the earthly realm as a person leading God's people. So when, when you listen to Paul write this letter to, uh, to Titus, he suggests that the main theme of being a pastor uh, in, in writing this letter is to, uh, uh, to let people know that grace and mercy are the, the real uh, uh, substratum of what the work that takes place uh, in, this, in, this, in, this, in the church, at least as it relates to the pastor, grace and mercy. And we already know what grace and mercy is. For those that don't know, uh, grace is God's unmerited favor. It means that you don't, you don't, you don't, uh, 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 you don't have to earn it. He gives it to you no matter what. And mercy is when God withholds from us 
the, the chastisement that we deserve. So that's what grace and mercy are, is unmerited favor, which means that God provides grace to everyone. You don't have to earn it. You can't earn it. He gives it to you. And mercy is, his, his, is when he withhold from us that chastisement or that, that judgment that we truly, truly deserve. But we thank God for his grace and his mercy. And so, 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 so Paul writes the letter to Titus to let him know that there's a responsibility to preach and teach and that the seriousness of his assignment is critical to the survival of the, the, not only the church, but the generations behind. And then most importantly, we all must appreciate God's grace and his mercy. Paul uh, is assigned to the Cretan, um, I'm sorry, Titus is assigned to the Cretan church or the church at Crete. And uh, of course there are some challenges because uh, Crete and its location is, all, is, is just as is hostile as the other churches that Paul writes to. But this is not a letter to the church. This is a letter to the pastor of the church. And he really tries to convey to the pastor how important it is to set up structure in the congregation so that people can have something to follow. Otherwise, if you lead from a loosey-goosey kind of mindset, people are going to be all over the place. It also teaches people to respect the authority that comes with being a part of a congregation. And we have to note that being a part of the church and being a part of a congregation are two separate things. And so I thank God for clarity about that. But Paul also wants this young pastor to know how important his responsibility is. Two scriptures that I want to give you tonight to remind you uh, to help to help you understand how serious the role of the pastor is. It is appointed by God. Paul does not call Titus to pastoral ministry. He only helps him to, to understand what he's embracing or what he's uh, embarking upon. But if you go to Jeremiah 3 and 15, Jeremiah 3 and 15, here's what Jeremiah writes to uh, the, the Israelites at a most critical time in their lives as they prepare to go into captivity. Here's what Jeremiah writes. He says, and I will give you, talking about God, shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. So, so the, the term shepherd means that you have the responsibility of the sheep. And, and, and in this case, the word shepherd uh, also in the Hebrew uh, means pastors. So God says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart, or according to my heart, whose responsibility will be to feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it's important for you to understand that, knowledge and understanding. So that means that that person has to have the knowledge and has to have the understanding in order to feed you. And God provides that for anyone who goes into pastoral ministry that's called by God, he provides you what? With those two things, knowledge and understanding. And if you go to Acts the 20th chapter, and verse number 28 is also recorded how God feels about the role of the pastor. He says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among, the, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which is purchased with his own blood. So the church doesn't belong to us. It belongs to Jesus. This is not Pastor Tate's church. And I get uh, at nowadays, I didn't used to do this because I, I was I was misled and I didn't understand. But nowadays, I cringe when people say my church. Uh, we don't have a church. We are a part of a congregation. The church belongs to Christ. It's his. God made him the head of the church. Matthew 16, upon this rock, I will build my church and the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The reason why the church is still standing, even after all of the scandals, after all of the craziness, after all of the splits and separations, after all of the hypocrisy, after all of the misunderstandings and misjudgments, the church still stands because it doesn't belong to people. If it belonged to people, it would no longer be here. But because it belongs to Jesus, he's already safeguarded it against people and our foolishness. So that's why it's a serious, serious thing when you say you are a part of the church because you are now a representative and a reflection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's not something that you take lightly or should take lightly. And I thank God for my understanding now. So when Paul writes this letter to Titus, 
and he brings him into the third chapter, but the letters weren't by chapter. So he comes to the conclusion of the letter. And it's the same thing that we saw last night, which is amazing to me, where exhortation becomes the priority of the closing of the letter, because Paul needs to remind them. That's what the text says. If you read verse number one of chapter three, I mean, chapter, yeah, chapter three of Titus, verse number one starts out by saying, remind them. And the them are the church, the Christians at Crite, or Crete, the Cretan Christians. I thank God for that. Here's what I want to drop in your spirit. If you are a part of a congregation and you are in a particular city or community, I'll say it again. I said it last night and the night before. You are called to serve the people of that community or that city as a part of the church. I know for years and years and years and years and years that we have been shown and taught that the most of or the majority of our work is done inside the building. Let me help you understand. The majority of our work as the church, as believers is done outside of the building. We spend a lot of time in the building with each other, which is not a problem because the Bible declares forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. We're called together to learn, and to share and to encourage and love on and receive from God a word that inspires and encourages, but it also empowers us to go out and do what we've always what we've been taught to do. So I want to I want to keep pushing the envelope on that because the season that we're in now is amazing because we're not in the building and there are more people that are are, are wandering because there's no place to go. And we've been taught that the church is you. Wherever you go, that's where the church is. So you gotta, you gotta learn that so that if you show up in your living room, you can be, you can go into worship right there and, and, and have the word and have a song and have a good time and go to sleep and just enjoy life. But we want always to gather and we want to be in the fellowship and there's nothing wrong with that. But Christ says, I've called you to an assignment. And, and Matthew 25 provides for us what those assignments are. And I won't, belabor, I won't belabor the time. And so Paul says to Titus, he says, remind them that their responsibility is totally to totally embrace the kingdom governing, the governing model. And the governing model, my friends, is that you and I are responsible for respecting and regarding the leadership of the cities and the communities in which we live. It is a part of our responsibility as Christians to respect the leadership. In other words, we should not be involved in tearing leaders down. Our role is resp and responsibility is to lift them up. Whether we like them or not, whether we trust them or not, whether we support them or not, whether we voted for them or not, None of those things matter, and it does not change what God expects of us as leaders. And if you, oblige, if you abide by that, it's a game changer, because now you know and believe that God can change anybody. So if you're praying for that person, and that person is living contrary to God's will, your prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man, avails much. So Paul reminds Tim, Titus to tell them, you've got to obey your leadership. You got to obey those that have rule over you, that have authority over your life. And I'm glad he recorded it because if I had to tell you that without proof, you wouldn't believe it. He says, you're subject to the rulers and authorities to obey them, to be ready to, to do every good work. I want you to underline that if you really have a Bible in front of you, to be ready, prepared to do every good work. What we do for Christ has already been classified as good work. And, and I want you to understand that whatever God has called you to do, you already have a hand up because God has given you the energy, the insight, as well as the competency to do good work. It depends on how you execute. It depends on how you execute. So Paul, Paul, Paul thought it necessary in this text to remind them that they have a responsibility to be humble and to live peaceably and be gentle to all men. In other words, you can't segregate and you can't be selective. Keep that in mind. You cannot segregate, you cannot 
be selective about who you show humility toward, who you show gentleness toward, and who you show peace toward. It's our responsibility to do that for all men. Again, another game changer. The church has a, a responsibility like none other. And if we did what we were supposed to do, the world may not be as different as we would hope, but people would be different. People would be different. And the power of the church would continue to persist and God would use that to change more lives. And so when you get to the latter part or the middle part of the chapter, Paul then takes a turn and says something that is very important. It's as a part of being humble, he says in, in verse number three, that let, let we ourselves were also once foolish, uh, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. He says we, and that means that him, his entourage, and everybody else who is now a Christian can never say that they were always spiritual. In other words, people that are of God, spiritual leaders, pastors, uh, overseers, bishops, apostles, prophets, we ain't always been saved. We ain't always been saved. We, we, got, we, got, we got some stuff that, that we, God had to deliver us from. And, and the truth be told, we, we got some, some, some things we still struggling with. So for me to come in and look down on you as your pastor is totally unacceptable. Totally unacceptable. Because God brought me out of something. So he did so, so that I would be able to relate to you and let you know what it's going to take for you to come out of whatever it is that you're wrestling with. And we're all wrestling with something. So I love Paul's uh, uh, his candor, but I also love his, his willingness to be, uh, 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 what's the word I want to use? Vulnerable. We all got to learn how to be vulnerable. And there's a time and place for that. Paul puts it in this letter to Titus so that he can remember that the position of pastor doesn't make him better than anybody. I have to remember that every day, that just because I'm pastor, I'm not better than anybody. I am a humble servant. That's why when Romans says, and such were some of you, I mean, 1 Corinthians says, and such were some of you, we read that the other night. You need to remember that all of us are ex somethings. So all of us are striving to be better somebody. But we got, some of us got baggage and we got to learn how to deal with the baggage. I think one day I'm going to write a book on baggage claim. Sometimes we pick up the wrong bag at the airport, at the bus station. Y'all don't know nothing about the bus station. Y'all don't know how to take that bus. The Greyhound ain't even y'all's spirit. Amen. But, but you, there are times when you pick up the wrong bag or there are times when you lose your bag. And when that happens, many people lose their way. So I'm saying to you that there are some bags you need to leave at home. And if you're going to put some in the bag, put something that is going to be refreshing and reviving for your life. So Paul closes out or he comes to the verses that we're talking about tonight. And here's what he says. He says, I want you to understand that, that, that you and I are a reflection of what God has done for us in our lives. And this is something that that the preacher has to continuously remind people of. We are here because of God's grace and mercy. I opened up with that, so that would be the priority of our thinking. Not because of the righteous deeds, not because we come to church, not because we serve on any, in any ministry, not because of any other reason, but because of God's grace and mercy. And, and Paul wants us to know that he extended his grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. In other words, when you got saved, when you gave God your hand and you accepted Christ as your savior, God extended his mercy and grace to you through Jesus Christ. So Jesus is that, 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 that I am that we talk about. He is the door. He is the good shepherd. He became all of those things to us so that you and I will have an opportunity to have a right relationship with God. So he is the avenue that we must take in order to get to God. And because of his sacrifice, as he came into the world through a virgin birth, and he brought in the dispensation of grace that now governs our lives, you and I are still here, not because we're good, not because we're faithful, not because we got it going on, but because of God's grace and mercy. So that keeps us in a state of humility. Because at any given time, 
at any given time, we can, we can slip off the radar and do things that are unbecoming of Christians and things that are not pleasing to God. And yet his grace and his mercy are still there for us. So we ought to appreciate God for that. And so he says in chapter number three, verse number six, and I'll leave you with this. And I love it because he says, he, uh, God poured out. I'm gonna go to it real quick. He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ. The word abundantly means over, uh, excessive. God blessed us abundantly. He poured out. So the, the, the work that Christ did on the cross, as a result of that, you and I were baptized. That's what regeneration is. And the Holy Spirit renewed us, came in and, re and cleansed us and cleaned us up. But it requires something of us so that we can move into position to be able to do that. Ezekiel, what's the proof text, our, our minister? There's another proof text. I love uh, what minister uh, Gwen does. She provides additional scriptures for us. And if you look in the chat, uh, uh, Titus 3 and 5 proof text is, is uh, Exodus, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. And it's important if you can read that, because in that he says, I have given you a new heart and a new spirit. So when you came to God, here it is. I want to read it real quick. When you came to God, where is it? It left me. Oh, God. I lost it. Oh, here it is. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So, so in other words, all that has happened to you that has caused you to be bitter and broken and empty God has says, I will give you a new heart and I will put in you a new spirit. That, that, my friends, is so important because now you and I don't have to carry around the sorrows and the burdens and the darkness that we once experienced before we met Christ. Now that we know him, we have the opportunity to be changed. And that change comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the moment you have that relationship with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit gets to work. And you then go through the transformation process. God brings you out of darkness into the marvelous light. He brings you from low to high. He brings you from being dark to light. He brings you from being empty to full. And he brings you from being broken to being whole. That's how significant the process is. And so my time is up, but what are you holding on to that is causing you to delay God's restoration process in your life? First John 1 and 9. I hope you got it. Write that down. First John 1 and 9. First John 1 and 9. Here's what First John 1 and 9 says. If you confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a commitment that God has made to us through Jesus Christ. And we studied that when we studied Psalms 51, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. That's a prayer request. One that you must keep on your lips and keep in your heart. All right, I'm done. I'm done, that's a process. You got to go through the process. So we're going to disable our recording so that people can feel free to ask questions because we, when we send this out and, and it's been asked, why not leave the recording on because somebody's heart might be changed as a result of somebody's question as opposed to just the overview because nobody else is talking. And so we'll, we, we've wrestled with that. But there are times when you, you try to share personal information and you may not want it to go out over the whole, the whole world. So we protect that because this is a safe place, all right? Should we take